Amen. Luke 15, uh, how many of you have your Bibles? Who brought your Bibles to the house of God? Amen? Amen. Show me your Bible. Show it up. Raise it up high. This Bible is the most important thing. Amen? Do you know that there's an attack on this word? I'll say it one more time. Did you know that there's an attack on this word? There's people that are trying to steal verses out of this thing. There's people that are trying to literally thank you, thank you. Everybody thank Jeremy. One more time for Jeremy. Just to embarrass him real good. Praise God. There we go. The word of God is the most precious thing that we have at our disposal. Did you know that? Jesus said that my words are spirit and they are life. Amen? And the way the world is trending and society is trending right now, there's, there's a tremendous attack upon the word. That means that people try to twist it, manipulate it, take it out of context. They try to distort it. They try to just edit it. They try to everything it. And it's all meant to be an attack from the enemy to blatantly destroy what God has said over our lives. Amen? Because, listen, if the gospel is changed by even the single letter, it will lose its power. We don't have the power, we don't have the authority to edit or to deny or to tear it up or to take anything out from it because in its wholeness, it is truth. Amen? I'll say it one more time. In its wholeness, it is truth. Everything in here pertains to us for life and for godliness. Amen? So I encourage you, church, always bring your Bible to the house of God. Amen? And if you have it on your phone, praise God. And if not, it's going to be on the screen behind me. So let's read Luke chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 1. When you're there in your Bible, say amen. When it's on the screen behind me, say amen. All right, there it is. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and he says, Rejoice with me for I have found my lost sheep. He said, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Amen. Let's keep going. Verse 8. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost coin. Amen. Verse 10 says, So in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. So let's go on verse 11. And Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them, and not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Verse 17, And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? He said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. 
And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is now found. And they began to celebrate. Amen. Amen. How many of you were once lost but now you are found in Jesus? Amen. That's a reason to celebrate. I want us to just pray for the word tonight. Lord, we just give this word to you. And we just thank you for it, Lord. It's your word. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak to us in a powerful, powerful way, Lord. Holy Spirit, you reveal truth to us tonight, Lord. And Father, I pray that every heart is ready, God, and open, Father, to receive of your word, Lord. And Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you, Lord, as your vessel. And speak, Lord, that which you wish in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. Luke 15 is one of the most you know, powerful illustrations and chapters, I believe, that we'll find in all of the Bible. It includes, you know, three of these most, you know, famous parables ever told, and they're super important. Each one of them has something unique to, to tell us, and, and, and I believe just unique truth and revelation to, to reveal to our hearts. And so the parables, they deal with the lost sinner and with the great love of God in seeking and receiving the lost sinner When the sinner repents and returns home. Amen. But right before that, Jesus in Luke 15, verse 1, we read it in the very beginning. It said the tax collectors and the, it says now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know, I've said this before that we can be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. What does that mean? That means that sometimes we can become so self-righteous that we don't actually want to sit down with somebody that needs Jesus. Amen? We can get so caught up in, in, in just us being right with God and us being ready to receive God and us being, you know, you know on our way to heaven that we don't actually take the time to sit with a sinner, to talk to somebody about the Lord. Amen? You know, I'm reminded in the Scripture, the Bible says that we were like a stick that was snatched from the burning fire. That means that every single one of us was was hell-bound, and we were on our way to an eternity without Christ. We were all lost. We were all enemies of the cross. We were all those that deserved the punishment that Jesus took upon his back. But the beautiful thing was the grace of God, and through the grace of God, and through the work of Jesus upon the cross, we were now found. At some point, you surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus, and you came to that saving knowledge of who he is and what he had done for your life. That is the most powerful thing ever. Amen? But now that we are found, and now that we're on this side of of the lost and found equation, now that we are those who are found, we cannot be so self-righteous that we would not choose to sit with one who is still lost. We cannot be so like, oh man, you know, I've already got one foot in heaven. I'm punching my ticket into heaven, but yet I'm not willing to even get near a person that is a sinner that still needs Jesus. If Jesus himself modeled the fact for us that he was willing to sit with sinners, that he was willing to sit with the lost, the broken, the destitute, those who were far off from God, how much more should we, church? But here's the thing. Many of you don't have a strong enough relationship with God to sit with a sinner and not be transformed by them and not be corrupted by them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Many of you know this verse, but I want you to write it down. It tells us, Paul spoke, he said, bad company corrupts good character. Now, I'm not saying that you become best friends with every sinner in the world. <laughs> But what I am saying is that we need to get off our high horse and actually get to work for the Lord. Amen. Because if we're on a high horse, there's no way that we can actually lend a hand to pull somebody up. 
pastor illustrated it this way a few weeks ago in his message. He said, it's much easier for somebody to pull you down from a platform like this than for me to pull somebody up. I like to believe I'm a pretty strong guy. But I'm pretty sure I probably couldn't pick some of you guys up. Why? Because in our relationship with the Lord, and in our knowing who we are in Christ, we have to be readied and prepared at the moment's notice to share and to show the love of Jesus with everyone that we come across. And if we're unprepared, we're not ready. If we are, you know, not walking in a true relationship with the Lord, then when we sit down with a sinner, they'll have more effect on us than we'll have on them. They'll drag you back into the old language that you used to speak. They'll drag you back into the old habits that you used to do. They'll drag you back into that place and that person that you once were. And so I say this as a warning to the church, but as, a, as an encouragement as well. Let's walk with Jesus. Amen? Let's walk with Jesus every day. We need his word. We need to know his word. So Jesus, after this, he responds to them by sharing this parable. Now, something that we need to understand as believers is, is again, we were once lost and now we are found. But I want us to, to, to understand something, church. People stay lost for different reasons. Let me, let me say that. Now, I, I, I'll, I'll give you a caveat for us to understand. First and foremost, we were all lost at birth. Do we understand that? The Bible says that we were created to be in communion with God in the very beginning in Genesis. Amen? But because of sin, we are now separated in the communion and the covenant with God was broken. So since you and I were born into the world, we were now born into a fallen creation. That is, that fellowship with God was now broken. And so we were away from God because of the destruction of sin in the world. So we must keep that in mind. But I want us to understand why several reasons why the world remains lost. Number one is this. Some remain lost because of foolishness. I'll share a little bit about that story again. Some remain lost because of foolishness. Jesus talked in the first parable about sheep. He talked about sheep. He used the illustration of sheep. Now, uh, unfortunately for sheep, they are renowned for their foolishness. They're not the smartest animal. Let's just put it that way. They're not, a, what's the smartest mammal? Like a dolphin or something? I think I heard or... I, what? An, an elephant, somebody said? I don't think it's an elephant. Maybe, who knows? But there's some pretty smart mammals. And there's some pretty smart animals in this world. But a sheep doesn't rank amongst the top. And so we understand that sheep are renowned for their foolishness. They will drink bad water when good water is nearby. They'll leave good grass for bad grass. They'll wander into thickets and they'll fall into ravines because they just have this kind of foolishness about their nature. And so they are required to have the constant care of a shepherd. Amen. This is why Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for my sheep. Amen. But like some people, some of us are foolish some of the time and some of us are even foolish most of the time. And some people, you know, add to their lostness from God more out of foolishness than malice. That is, they stay in a lost state. They stay away from God because of foolishness. That is, just like I said, they choose wrong friends. And they, and they go wayward because of the friends and the influence that they have in their, their life. And they're sucked into these damaging relationships. In their foolishness, they maybe experiment with alcohol or with drugs, and all of a sudden they find themselves addicted. So they ignore the opportunities for Christian faith and godly living because they're too busy or they think that Christianity is boring. This is why some people stay lost. They're like a hiker that goes out into a forest. Now, how many of you have ever been to a forest? Anybody ever been to a forest? Raise your hand. Okay, I, last forest I think I went to was like a, I think it's called Lincoln National Forest in, in uh, Ridoso, New Mexico. Now, if you've ever been in a forest and you ever go hiking and, and like you get into the forest, right? Like you get past 
the trail and you get past like the river or, or something and you get into the forest. How many of you know that every tree looks the same? <laughs> Once you're out there, it's like, you know, if you don't have a sense of direction, if you don't have a compass, if you don't know how to like tell like, oh, the sun's over there, you know, that's west or that's east or that's north or south. If you don't have a landmark to look at, but all you see is trees, you're going to get lost and you're going to get stay lost really quickly. So people that go out and they'll hike in a forest, they'll suddenly realize that they're totally lost and they're far from home. They're desperately alone and they do not know what to do. Now, because of their lostness, they could have prepared ahead of time and they could, they could have done something better to not get themselves in the mess. The second people are this. Some people stay lost because of other people. There's people who get lost in life because of others. Now, Jesus compares them to a lost silver coin. In those days, people were really poor. So when we read this parable, I need you to understand some context, and, and we'll, we'll get into this deeper in a second. But they were really poor. That is, 10 silver coins probably represented a lifetime of savings. Think about this. So imagine right now if you had your retirement just, you know, sitting on your living room floor, on your bed or something like that. All your retirement, everything that you've worked for and the job that you've worked for and the money that you've saved and the assets that you have and you had it all there. And all of a sudden, you know, this huge chunk of your retirement, this huge chunk of everything that you put away, it, it goes missing. So people back then, this probably represented a lifetime of savings. So when a coin gets lost, understand this, it didn't lose itself. When the coin got lost, it did not lose itself. That is, coins don't think for themselves. They, they aren't foolish. They're incapable of losing themselves. That means that someone lost the coin. Understand this. The coin here is the victim of someone else's behavior and negligence. Now, I say this tenderly, and I say this, you know, with, with understanding in our hearts tonight. There may be some people in this room tonight, or maybe you know some, someone that was, was harmed in a really bad way as a child. Maybe they were abused. Maybe they were verbally abused, physically abused. And they were harmed in such a bad way that all of a sudden it spiraled them off into a life of, of, of not just being lost because they were already lost. But it actually pushed them even further from God down a path that they had never intended because of someone else's behavior, of someone else's negligence. My heart breaks, church, when I hear stories of people that were victims of such abuse it really does it breaks my heart because because you 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 just you're disgusted at the idea that somebody would just harm somebody in such a foul and and perverse way that they would damage somebody for life because of something they did or something they said or or somewhere that they went or something that they allowed to happen to this person's life it's almost as if the parents and the other adults set out to lose them. Now, there's a lot of, you know, more examples that we could draw from. But let's, you know, just understand this is that a lot of people and for a lot of people nowadays, their lostness and their state of lostness is due largely in part because of something that happened in their life. A lot of people nowadays, and this is, this is something that the Lord showed me a few years ago, was that there's a lot of people nowadays that have this, this they, they, they want to receive what Jesus has, but they do not trust the Father. In other words, there's a separation in their heart because they've had an abusive father or neglected father, or they didn't have a father present in their life. And therefore, when it comes to the idea of hearing a prayer like, Father who art in heaven, it actually disgusts them because they cannot believe that somehow a father could be good. And there's this lack of like desire to know a father because they've only seen what their earthly and worldly father looked like and how damaging it was to their life. And they don't want to pursue God for that reason. 
I've seen it over and over. I've counseled many, many people that, that actually struggle with this same issue. If you look at people nowadays and the statistics will tell you that fatherless homes, that doesn't even mean that the dad's not there. The dad could be there. He's just not present in their life. But fatherless homes are the most damaged homes. These are the kids that are coming up to be the drug dealers and, and the abusers and the people that are, you know, out in the world and they're staying lost because of a negligent person in their life. And it's an ongoing struggle for these people to believe that God loves them because they cannot imagine having a loving father. The next group of people who are lost some are lost because of rebellion. Luke 15 and 11, you know, the story of, of, the, of the prodigal son. Some are lost in this life just because of their own rebellion. I would venture to say that many of us know, you know, a child that was raised in church. Maybe you know somebody that was raised in church. They were, you know, brought up in the Lord. But when the time came that they were 18, 19 years old and they began to, you know, you know, spread their wings and fly off on their own, that they fell away from God. Why is that? Think about it. We see it all the time. They go off to college and then that's it. It's like the relationship with God is, is, is non-existent. And parents fear this day. They fear this day for their child because they say, Lord, I, I pray that I was able to do everything. I took him to church enough, God. I, I did all these things. And some of it is just flat out rebellion. Some of it, though, rebellion often occurs because a uh, pastor, you know, said this phrase to me one time. He said, rules without relationship equals rebellion. That means that if the parent, as a Christian, is in the home and is telling their child to do something, well, hey, you need to listen to the pastor and you need to, you know, go to church and you need to do all these things, but they see mom and dad not living it out, rules without a relationship, they're going to rebel. Because there's not a true godly example at home. But Proverbs 22 talks about training up a child in the ways of the Lord. And when they're trained properly, when they grow old, they will not depart from it. That is a promise of God, right? But see, it cannot be done the wrong way and we expect the right result. We have to do it the right way and trust God. So some people just, they stay lost because of their rebellion. That is, they deliberately and knowingly choose the worst over the best, bad over good, sin over righteousness. They just go out and they just do it. And so Jesus tells us one of his most famous parables about that son who was blessed. He was blessed. This kid had everything. He even had a father that listened to him. What did he ask him for? He asked him for his inheritance. And what did the father do? He gave it to him. But that young man, we, we know from Scripture, that young man goes off and what does he do? He takes the inheritance that his father gave him. And what does he do? He goes and he completely wrecks his life. He throws it away. The scripture says he, he goes out and he just throws it all away in wild living. Wild living, that, that scripture, that portion of scripture is translated to like lawlessness. He's just like, you know, said, I ain't going to listen to nobody. I'm just going to go do whatever I want. And so in those days, I want us to understand this. The oldest son, the oldest son received two thirds of the father's wealth and the rest was divided amongst the other children. This is how it was in Jewish custom. And so sometimes after the father would retire or otherwise turn over his assets to his children within their lifetime, that's what would happen in the family. That two-thirds of the wealth would be given to the older son. And so the younger son, they had comfort, they had love, they had security, they had a, you know, food, they had job, they had a warm bed. And this younger son had all of the blessings this younger son, I believe, would be the absolute envy of the population of the world, but he was not satisfied. So what does he do? He goes out and he wastes it all in wild living. Question, how do we explain such behavior? Is it more than stupidity? Is it arrogance? Is it selfishness? Is it a deliberate personal choice to walk away from what is good and pursue what is bad? I don't know. But the point is this. The point is same for each of the stories that Jesus mentions is that people remain lost for different reasons. And in some reasons, it doesn't really matter. In some cases, that's not even the point. You see, if your sheep or your coin or your son is missing, that's what's most important. 
Regardless of how something was lost, the most important thing of these parables is that you find it again. The most important moral of each and one of these parables and these stories is that we find it again. This is the message that Christ was preaching and teaching day in and day out. And this is the message and the word of the Lord that he is trying to get back in the hearts of his people. How many of you know, church, that that sometimes we need a wake-up call? Amen? Sometimes we need a wake-up call. How many of you have ever gone to a hotel and you ask them to give you a wake-up call? You know that they do that? You just press the button, you're just like, boop. And then somebody at the front desk, you tell them, like, hey, you know, I need a wake-up call at 7.30 or at 8 o'clock, you know, because you've got some important meeting that you've got to go off to. And guess what? They will call you at that time. And there's times for us that we need a wake-up call as a body. We need a wake-up call as the church because here's the deal. It's not so much about how the world is wicked. It's not so much about how the world is lost and how the world is is hell-bound as some believe and how some choose to sin and how some are the result of others. The message is clear. It's about how God wants them back. That's what the Lord is emphasizing in these stories. Now, I could come up here and waste your time and tell you about how lost the world is, or we could prepare ourselves to win the world back to Jesus. Amen? And bring reconciliation and bring restoration back into that place of communion where the Lord wants us to be. The point is, church, is that he wants us back. He wants us back if we've wandered off in our foolishness and our ignorance. He wants us back if we were lost because of the misbehavior or the negligence of somebody else. He wants you back even if you've deliberately rebelled against him and ran in the opposite direction. And so this is Jesus' portrait of God for us to see and for us to understand. And that is that God loves us. And that God seeks us and he seeks to find us. He wants to show us his forgiveness, to hold us, to bless us, to keep us forever, to to bring us back into communion with him. And did you know, church, that God will go through great lengths to get your attention? Can I tell you just a little bit about the lengths that God brought me through to get me into his presence? I saw event after event, thing after thing happen in my life. Different things that just caused me to wonder. And and you you know that the Lord knows you better than you know yourself. God knew exactly what needed to happen in my life to get me to go like this and look up to heaven. He knew exactly what needed to happen in my life to get me to like wake up one day and understand that there was a God that loved me and he sought after my life. But I'll never forget, there was a series, there was, there was three events. There was a divorce, a near death, and a relocation. My parents get divorced when I'm 13 years old. My stepbrother, you know, uh, I, I'm relocated to Texas in 1997. God brings me 1,800 uh, miles away, 1,900 miles away from where I grew up, relocates me to South Texas. I have no friends here. I barely have any family here. And, and all of a sudden, I'm in a completely different world. Because trust me, Boise, Idaho, and South Texas aren't exactly the same. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> We only had like one Mexican restaurant. It was called Cafe Ole. <laughs> and it wasn't even good. Because <laughs> I've had the food here and it's amazing. But I, my, my parents went through a divorce. There was a relocation in my life. And then the third thing that happened was my stepbrother almost died. He was almost killed in a car crash. Ejected out of a vehicle. He flew 30 yards. 30 yards is, is about two-thirds of this building. So 30 yards is like here that way. It's about 90 feet right there because the building's 120 feet wide. He was ejected out of a car. He flew and landed on his head on an icy road. And I'll never forget, I came to church on a Wednesday night in about November of 1997. It was like Thanksgiving week. And our youth pastor at the time, he made one simple invitation. He simply said this, does anybody need prayer? Do you know, church, that is one of the most important things that you can ask this world? Does anybody need prayer? 
Because in that moment that you propose that question, church, you are actually opening the door for your God to reveal his miracle working power in their life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give him praise. And it's such a simple question because when the question is posed, God's put on the spotlight. Right? When the question is posed, God is, God is now like front and center. And now you are proposing that your God that you believe in and have placed all your faith and trust in, that he is able to do exceedingly more than you could ever ask or think of. So there was a question that was given to my life, and they says, does anybody need prayer? And I didn't even know the real idea of prayer, to be honest with you. I never grew up in church, but I, I accepted, and I said, I need you to pray for my stepbrother. By this time, he had been in a coma uh, for several days, and he was actually in a coma for a, a little a period of, of just over three weeks. They said if he comes out of the coma, if he gets his memory back, if he, if he comes back, you know, that he may be, like, in a vegetative state. He may just, you know, be like, you know, the lights are on, but nobody's home. And that night they prayed, and, and, and I didn't even know what faith was. I didn't even know who they were praying to. I just was hoping that their prayer would do something. Amen? Because this was lost Duke. This was the, the young man that was far away from God. I didn't know the Lord. And so they prayed, and, and I go to Idaho like a couple weeks later during my Christmas vacation. I walk into a room, and I see my stepbrother, who was once a big Burly, strong young man, like he, he was super skinny. He had lost over 40 pounds being in the hospital. And he looks at me with a blank stare, and he doesn't even recognize me. And I'm like, it's me, man, your brother. And over the next few days, I literally watched God do work in his life. I saw his eyes open. I saw his memory come back. And I literally got to see him walk out of the hospital under his own power. And you cannot tell me as a, as a 15-year-old kid that God was not real and that God was not alive. I knew that God was alive. I knew that, that somehow these people that prayed a prayer had just connected to one that had a power that was greater than anything I had ever seen in this world. In church, like it was that moment that somebody just simply said, do you need prayer? That connected me to the Lord, that connected me to this one who had been seeking after my soul because he had a purpose and a plan for my life. God seeks those who are lost. And I wrote down these, these few points. Number one, he seeks after the lost like a shepherd is searching. Just like the first parable that we read, he's one that goes out, he goes out to search and find the one that is missing. In those days, the community sheep, they were actually, you know, herded and flocked together. That is often they were communally owned. They were owned by several different shepherds and there were several shepherds that were assigned to watch over the flock. And so if one sheep had wandered off, a shepherd would leave the rest in the care of the other shepherds and diligently begin a search. And the rule was this, was that he had to bring back the sheep or the fleece. That is, if the animal was alive, he had to bring it home alive. Or if it was killed by the wolves, he had to at least bring home a piece of its fleece as proof. Either way, though, the shepherd was to go to great lengths to find the lost sheep. Let's read those verses, Luke 15 and 4. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. He calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. He said, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Jesus is telling us that if we wander from God out of our foolishness, he will come looking for us. Amen? That if we wander off because of our own mistakes or our own, you know, craziness or whatever, he will come searching after us. God will hunt us down and he will go to great lengths to find you because his delight is to bring us back to him. 
His delight is to have fellowship with you again. His delight is to bring you close to, to Him again, that when you are reunited with God, and you're brought back into that place of union with God, that all of heaven would rejoice. And all of heaven would shout, because guess what? A sinner has come home. A sinner has repented. Amen? Luke 5 and 32, Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is a mission of our Lord and Savior. He didn't come to simply sit amongst the righteous and rub shoulders. He wasn't, you know, about, you know, being, you know, the well-dressed guy in the synagogue. He wasn't about showing off himself, you know. Sometimes we tend to get a little too religious. We, we tend to, you know, dress up on Sundays and, you know, we try to look the part and act the part and all this kind of stuff. But guess what? The Lord's not really interested in that. That's eye candy for other people to think that you're somehow, you know, more religious than you really are. The Lord's always, though, interested in the heart. The Lord's always interested in that heart coming into repentance. How many of you own a pet? Raise your hand. Is there any, any pet owners in the house? Praise God. Yes. How many of you love your pet? Amen. Yes, DJ loves his pet. Okay. I can guarantee that when you lost, how many of you have lost a pet? Oh, let me say that. Yeah, woof. Whew. Losing a pet, man. Losing a pet's hard. But if you lost a pet, what did you do? You went searching. Yeah, I know you did. Some of you went out late at night. Fido! <laughs> Bingo! Whatever his name was. Chancho, you know, like, you know, you're out there trying to find Chancho, you know, because he's, he's lost. <laughs> he's in the wilderness. He's not in the backyard like he's supposed to be. He's not under the porch, you know, under the patio where his home is, where he has food and water and shelter and your care and your protection. He's out in the world. And it's crazy because I've seen people go to great lengths to find a dog. I'm being honest with you. I've seen people put up reward posters. I've seen people make cards. I've seen people share it all over the internet. And guess what? They won't tell one person about Jesus. They won't tell one person that, oh, man, you know what? You need to come back to Jesus. You need to come back home. You need to know the Lord. You need to have a relationship with him. You need to repent. They won't say that, but, oh, chanchito. They're out there desperately searching for Chancho in the wilderness because guess what? They think that their pet is more important than doing the will of God. Man. Ezekiel 34 verse 11 says this. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. He said, I myself will search for my sheep and I will look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. And I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I ask the question, though, do you care for sinners the same way that God cares for you? The reality is, is that some of us really don't. And my prayer for your life would be this, is that God would break your heart so that you could feel what he feels. And so that you would know what he feels when he's constantly rejected by those that he has purposed and willed and designed and planned to, 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 to have purpose in life. I believe nothing hurts more the, the, the heart of God. This is why Jesus wept, because he had longed to gather that city of Jerusalem, those that he had given his life for, those that he had walked amongst, those that were so blind to see who he was. He had longed to gather them in and he wept. He wept, and, 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 and I, I bring up pets because, you know, they have a place in our heart and our life. But I'm going to be honest with you. If a pet is more important, if a pet tugs at your heart more than, than, and you feel more for a pet than you do for a human, and you do for a sinner, and you do for somebody that's lost and, and, and needs to know Jesus, then my friend, my friend, this kingdom is not Lord over your life, and this Lord is not Lord over your life. I'm serious. There needs to be a shift in our hearts. 
There needs to be a transformation in our hearts that we would care for sinners the same. Charles Spurgeon said this, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. That's it. No options. You're either on a mission and the mission of God or you're an imposter. The second thing is this. Jesus further illustrates the heart of God for the lost when he goes on to say that God is like a woman that's looking. Let's read verse 8. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light the lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and she says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost coin. He says, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Back in these days, houses were very dark with all, one small window and the floors were like dirt and they were covered with grass and with, with thatch, which is like, you know, dead grass. And it was no easy task to find a small coin because the coin, but because the coin was so valuable to this woman, she was willing to light a lamp. That is, she would light a lamp and she would move the thatch off the ground and she would sweep up everything and sift through it all until she found what was lost. Now, I'll ask a question. Have you ever seen a woman lose her makeup? Ladies, <laughs> Have you ever seen a woman lose her makeup? It's like, where's that eyeliner? Where's the lipstick? What do they do? They turn the house upside down, you know, to find that thing. They'll, t- they'll, they'll tip the purse over inside and out. They'll, they'll, they'll search the car. They'll search anything to find the thing that they're missing. And the point that Jesus is making here is very obvious, is that we are very valuable to God, that everyone is very valuable to the Lord. Now, whatever the reason, that's not important of, of our lostness, but the truth is, is that the Lord will search high and low. He'll search for every way, every way possible to bring you back into a place of relationship and communion with him. I'm so grateful that the Lord allowed me to go through the things that I went through so that I could one day know him. The way that the Lord was doing things in my life so that I could open my eyes to see that God was always there. Don't imagine that God doesn't care. Think about this. Don't pretend that God is hard to find even. We're the ones, though, that are hard to find. God wants us. But just like it was from the beginning in in, in the book of Genesis, we just like Adam and Eve, we, we hide. We go away. We hide from God. We hide from God because of our sin. And sin ultimately causes people to have shame. And shame ultimately causes people to have distance. And it pushes you away and away and away and away. So that the further the distance is created, it's as if though you are unreachable by God. I'll never forget this verse that, that my then girlfriend shared with me one day, and I needed desperately to hear this. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, it says that the Lord's ear is not dull that he cannot hear you, nor is his arm too short that he cannot save. And I remember I was at a point in my life one day that I had felt like I had just made mistake after mistake and sin after sin and I was like you know what like there's no way but when I read that he was just a prayer away it just erased all of the distance that the enemy had tried to put between me and the Lord through shame through you know a lack of not repenting and so it was the most, it, one of the most pivotal times for me because I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God where you could find yourself maybe feeling distant from God and away from God. And somebody just needs to know that the Lord is just a prayer away. Amen. He really is. The Lord, the Bible says, but it was because of our iniquities that it separated us from him. You see, the Lord is still a holy and perfect and righteous God. 
And there's times where we have to say, Lord, I have failed. I, I need to repent of this. Lord, I need, to, I need to come back to you. Lord, I need to have your blood wash over my life, Jesus, because I have failed you. And when we say that, the relationship is restored. Amen. The relationship is made whole again. And the third thing that we see that the Lord illustrates the heart of God for the lost when he goes on to say that he is like a father that's watching. He's like a father that's watching your life. See, these are very powerful truths that he's like a shepherd looking for a lost sheep or a woman searching for a lost coin. But the most powerful picture of all is that of a father watching and looking out for a lost son and for a lost daughter. That's the most powerful picture I believe that you would find in scripture because that rebellious son took everything and ran and wasted his life. But the scripture says when he came to his senses, he realized how good he had it before. He realized how good life was with God, how, how special life, or life was being in his father's house. And the truth of the matter is that sometimes people in their rebellion actually need to hit rock bottom so that they realize that it was God, the rock, that they had been standing on this whole time. Sometimes people need to just be left to their own devices to just like fall off a, a, a spiritual cliff per se and hit rock bottom so that they can look back up and see that Jesus is their rescuer. Jesus is the one who will deliver them from their life and from their life of sin. But this young man, the Bible says that he decides to go home and ask for a job on his dad's farm. And it was this great act of humility because every day he had been reminded, you know, of all that he had given up. Everything that he had squandered in the world every single day. But here was the thing is he found this little glimpse of hope that he could be a hired hand, but never a son again. He thought, if, if I can just somehow get back into dad's business, I'd be happy enough just being a hired hand, but never a son. He was willing to just be a servant once again and not a son. And I think often about the title of this story because the title of the story is, it's the parable of the prodigal son, but it could easily be called the parable of the loving father. It could easily be called the parable of the loving father because it's far more about the father than it is about the son. It's far more about the revelation of who the father is than it is about the son because while the son was a long ways off, his father saw him. While his son was a long ways off and he was squandering his life, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for his life and he ran to his son. He ran to his son to rescue him from the grip that the world had placed upon his life. And he was filled with compassion for him. He threw his arms around him and he kissed his son. And the Bible says that the father welcomed him home with a celebration. He gave him a robe and a ring. And I don't know about you after you've made a mistake, but maybe some of you have had a dad that, that, you know, said, well, you shouldn't have done that. I told you, you went off and you rebelled. You went off and did this. You went off and did that. You shouldn't have done that. But this is not what this father proclaimed over his son's life. He celebrated because his son was like dead, but now his son was alive again. His son was now made whole. And so the point is, is that this is about God. These parables Jesus was teaching us about who God is like and how God feels towards us and acts towards us. That when we are gone, he misses us and he longs for us and he watches and he waits yearning day and night for your return. And you need to know and you need to not fear that he will lecture you or punish you somehow that when you come home, but he'll actually welcome you home. He'll dust you off. He'll take, take his robe, his cloak. He'll put it over your life. He'll put a ring on your finger and he'll restore your life back to him. This is the father that I know. This is the father that I know, the God that I serve. He will love you like no one else will ever love you in this world, church. 
That's good news. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. He will love you like nobody else will ever love you in this world. And as I ask you to just bow your heads tonight, I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God or even if you have a relationship with God. Maybe there's somebody here that is tremendously far away in their heart. You might think you're close because of religion or you might think that you're close because you come to church on a Wednesday night. But here's the truth of the matter. Maybe you do not feel God's presence. You don't even know that he is with you right now and your heart is in shame and there's something that is pending between you and God that you need to repent of. You need to say, God, this thing, this, this sin in my life, Lord, it's what's kept me far from you, Lord. If that's you tonight, then I want to pray with your life because I want to see the Lord bring you back into restoration, back into that place where it's an unbroken fellowship, an unbroken communion between you and God. And can I tell you that even the smallest things can separate us from the heart of God. Sometimes we're quick to think, oh, well, I haven't done anything that bad or anything that big. There's a lot of things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Our language, the way we talk about people, there's a lot of things that grieve the Holy Spirit, that grieve the heart of God. And Father, I pray right now that there's things that are coming to the surface in our hearts tonight. Something that we may have said, Lord, it could have just been, Lord, a harsh word towards our parents, Father. Whatever it is, Lord, you're bringing it to the surface right now. And I just pray right there where you are, church, just begin to deal with the Lord tonight. And just allow the Lord to just work in your heart tonight. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I know you're working right now. I see you working over your children right now, Jesus. And, and Father, we just pray, Lord, that for the purification of our hearts tonight, Lord, that, God, if there's something, God, that is, that is between us and you, Lord, we want that thing removed tonight so that, Lord, you would just come running back to us, Lord. Cleanse our hearts, Lord, because every day, Lord, it's your purpose, Lord, that we would become more and more like your precious son, Jesus. That we would see your transforming work in our life, Lord, every single day, God. Do the work, Lord. We give you access into our hearts tonight. He's welcoming somebody back home right now. He's welcoming somebody back home right now. Thank you, Jesus. He's welcoming you back home right now. And Father, we just thank you for that. We just thank you for that, Jesus. We just thank you for your power, God.